All right. Good day, everyone, and a very happy new year to all of you. Uh, even though we're already past the halfway point in January, uh, today's our first webinar of 2022. And uh, even my kids had their first day back at school for the year. So it does feel like things are just getting going to, to some degree. Um, it is, as always, so good to have so many of you join us yet again. And I know you're all in for a real treat today. I also wanted to mention that today we are sitting down and enjoying our 51st webinar, uh, which is quite extraordinary. I'll say that again, 51. It's amazing how the time's flown as well. Um, but a big thank you from our side. Uh, whether it's your first or your 51st, your support has been thoroughly appreciated. A big thank you as well to our incredible tour leaders uh, who have turned speakers and presenters during this time. And uh, finally, to my co-host, Nikki Stewart, uh, whose energy, positivity and smile have been and continue to be shining lights during what has been an interesting time for the travel industry as a whole. Uh, thankfully, many regions of the globe continue to open up as we all learn to live with COVID. I know many of you are actively traveling and planning future trips again. And tonight we have a very special webinar for you indeed. Joining us today is Adam Wallane, who's one of Rock Jumper's most traveled tour leaders. Uh, he's birded actively for many years across all seven continents and leads tours to them all as well. Uh, he also boasts a world list in excess of eight and a half thousand species. And he spent considerable time guiding on board adventure cruise vessels and his experience really is second to none. Uh, he's voyaged uh, extensively through the Arctic regions, Antarctica, uh, other remote regions such as the Mel Melanesian Islands, uh, Papua New Guinea's remote islands, New Zealand's Subantarctic Islands, um, and even some of the other remote Subantarctic band uh, islands such as Inaccessible uh, and also the remote uh, West Papuan Islands as well. Um, so yeah, incredibly experienced uh, when it comes to, comes to uh, cruises and, and leading on board those vessels. But tonight, Adam is going to share his vast knowledge of the Russian Far East, uh, where the Pacific Ring of Fire, Chukotka, the Wrangell Islands, the Siberian coastline all play host to an extraordinary number of seabirds. And the highlights and experiences in this part of the world are simply spellbinding. Before I get too carried away, uh, let me hand over to Adam for today's presentation. I do hope you all enjoy it thoroughly and please feel free to send through any questions to us via the chat or the Q&A box as uh, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. And on that note, it's over to you, Adam. Do enjoy everyone. Okay, thanks very much, Keith and, and Nikki and welcome everyone um, for my, my presentation on the Russian Far East. So, I had a chance to um, start working in the region about 14 years ago, uh, working for Heritage Expeditions and with the Russ family. And um, at that time, we, we really didn't know what was in store for us as we made our first trips into the Russian Far East. And um, to, to be honest, the region was actually fairly poorly known to anyone in the Western world. Um, but we were just blown away day after day by what we found. And so I ended up spending a number of summers uh, working on on the vessel exploring most of the islands and and many of the bays along this huge coastline so i'm quite passionate about the region and um, hopefully you'll see why in the next hour so i'll refer to this map uh, a few a few times through the talk just to sort of um, situate you in, in what, what area we're talking about so er everything on the left hand side of the map is basically the russian far east it's it's an enormous area it's really the size of a small continent so i got a lot to talk about um, today so the Russian Far East is part of Russia, but it lies um, eight time zones away from Moscow. So the, it, it's an odd mix. Uh, the, the culture is very odd there. There is a mix of, of what we think of probably the more typical Russian culture with, with the Lenin statues and all the rest of it, um, side by side with indigenous hunter-gatherer societies. And there's some Koryak people. So it's a, it's a really rich and interesting mix of, of cultures, although the region is largely uninhabited. Um, <clears throat> there's almost no roads in this whole enormous region and air travel is, is quite limited. So in terms of uh, wildlife, natural history um, perspective, um, by far your best bet is, is to go on an expedition vessel and uh, an ice strength an ex expedition vessel. And so with Rock Jumper, we, we partner with, with Heritage Expeditions who, who have been running 
um, tours there for for about 15 years, and um, they, I think they've run more more tours there than than probably all the other expedition travel companies combined. So they're, they're certainly the the experts in the region and um, and really wildlife focused uh, focused trips in this region. So you you uh, you live, sleep, and eat on the vessel, and then use the uh, inflatable zodiacs for. Um, for zodiac cruising and and for landing, and we usually try and land um, once or once or usually twice uh, twice every day, plus some zodiac cruising for for scenery and, and wildlife. <clears throat> so um, in terms of uh, bases, um, there's two main ports in the Russian Far East that we use: uh, Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky down here on the on the Kamchatka Peninsula is the main one, as well as Anadar on the Chukotka Peninsula. And these, these places both have uh, airports and seaports, so um, you can fly into there and, and board or, or depart the vessels. Increasingly, um, tours are being run as international tours, so they're starting, in, starting or ending in a different country than Russia. And so those will be out of Hokkaido, out of Otaru port in Hokkaido, which is down here at the bottom of your screen, um, as well as uh, Nome, Alaska. So Nome, Alaska is uh, really quite convenient place for, for American travelers to get to, to explore Russia. And, and there will be trips that, that start and end in Nome, um, which makes, makes it quite convenient to, uh, to get on board. So um, lots of different itineraries can be run um, in this region, but um, I'll, I'll, there are sort of four, four primary uh, itineraries. So the Ring of Fire starts here. Um, in the south runs through the Kuril Islands along the Ring of Fire, the Kamchatka Peninsula, and then the Commander Islands out here, which is the end of the Aleutian Island chain. So that's the Ring of Fire. And you can see on this map, it does clearly follow the Ring of Fire. Um, another itinerary is the Sea of Okhotsk, which is this great big sea over here. Um, a third one is Siberia's Forgotten Coast, which starts in Kamchatka and then runs all the way up to the Chukotka Peninsula and ends in either Chukotka or, or in Nome. And um, <clears throat> the other one is, is the Wrangell Island trip, which takes in the North Siberian coast and, and Wrangell Island up here at the top. Um, so th those are the four, four main itineraries. Um, so, but this talk is about, about the wildlife of the Russian Far East. Um, so I'd describe the wildlife like this. I mean, there's very, you don't go there to see a bunch of endemic species. There's, there's actually relatively few species that are only to be found in the Russian Far East. Uh, most of them can also be found in, in Alaska or, or in Japan. Uh, but but uh, for me, the reason to go there for the wildlife is, is the quality of experiences that you have there. I mean, and I'd, I'd, I'd really contend that, that you'll have some of, some of your most intense wildlife watching experiences in the world are to be found in, in the Russian Far East. And so I, I won't be going through um, itineraries as such on this trip over, over such, a, such a wide region. You can, you can read those online. Um, but I, I just wanna, I've broken the region up into, into five different areas and I wanna go through each of those and just talk about some of the, um, some of the experiences are to be had in, in each of those regions. Okay, so we'll start with the Kuril Islands. So we'll go south, south to north through the talk. We'll start with the Kuril Islands. So the Kuril Islands are all volcanic islands. Um, they barely even show up on, on a map of this scale, but the, they run, they connect, um, they connect Hokkaido to uh, Kamchatka. So they're a string of, string of volcanic islands along the Ring of Fire. Um, so the northern and the southern Kuril Islands are relatively large mountainous and, and well forested. They really do feel a lot like being in Hokkaido and the bird life and, and the wildlife is, is to match. So Siberian ruby throat is one of the most, uh, one of the most common songbirds in the Kuril Islands. We've even seen Blackiston's fish owl in the Kuril Islands, although that's quite rare. Um, Steiniger scoter, an East Asian uh, specialty is to be found quite commonly in the Kuril Islands. Uh, Harlequin ducks are abundant in the mountain streams and on the coastlines. Um, so it's well worth spending um, some days exploring these, these um, larger Kuril Islands. But uh, the real exciting part about the Kuril Islands is, is the central part and these small volcanic islands. And there, there's several of them. Th this one is probably the most exciting one, Yankicho Island. Um, but there's a string of, of small volcanic islands. And a lot, some of them have a flooded caldera. So this is actually the caldera entrance here on the left-hand side of the screen. 
you can see the fumaroles uh, down here, and we can actually get the get the uh, zodiacs inside of the flooded caldera. But all of these islands are host host to some of the largest seabird colonies in the world, and um, they're just they're just birds everywhere. So uh, black-legged kittiwake is is a very common species throughout the Russian Far East, as is northern fulmer. They're always following the ship around in in droves. But uh, here in the North Pacific and um, it's really the, the Alcid uh, family that bring through the, the diversity. And that's certainly the case in, in the Kuril Islands. So we have everything from, from the common widespread species like these thick-billed and common murres through to uh, the whiskered auklet, which is be the most, most wanted uh, Alcid or, or seabird in, in the Kuril Islands, a very localized bird that nests on just, just a few islands in, in the North Pacific. And, uh, probably the most spectacular, funky looking of all the, of all the alcids. Um, so it is these, uh, these auklet colonies getting around these massive auklet colonies in, in the Kuril Islands that, that is, is one of the, the great experiences of, of this trip. And so we're talking here colonies in uh, numbering up, up into the hundreds of thousands and in some cases into the millions of these birds. And uh, they return to the colonies in the evening. So what happens? Uh, we'll sit out in the zodiacs off the colony as the birds start to, to raft up on, on the water in flocks of thousands, hundred, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. And then as the sun starts to uh, dip, the birds start to, to come into the island. And um, at this point, if we're at Yankeecha at this point, we, we try to get the zodiacs inside the caldera um, and, and watch the spectacle unfolding. And then as, as it starts to get darker, the sky literally fills with birds and it just looks like black, black smoke everywhere you, you look. It's, uh, it's an incredible experience. Um, here, here's a picture of some folks sitting in the zodiac with the birds swirling all around. The sky literally pretty much turns, turns black and I can't, I can't give you a picture or a video to, uh, to, to give you a sense of what it's like, but it, it really is one of the great natural history phenomenons in, in the world. Um, being at one of these enormous auklet colonies at dusk. And then as it gets dark, the birds start to, to land on the rocks and then they head into their burrows. Uh, they head into their burrows for the night. And we often uh, return to the colonies in, in the morning. There's a much more drawn out um, process of the birds heading out to sea through the morning. And um, you often get some really good photo ops. So the light can be a little bit uh, better for these kind of photographs in the morning. So they're well worth visiting at, at uh, other times of day as well. Um, so marine, uh, marine birds, but also marine mammals throughout the Russian Far East and, and in, in the Kuril Islands um, are, are the other big highlight of the region. So sea otters are very common there, one of the most important areas for sea otters. And that there's a couple places we go there that have literally hundreds of sea otters and their heads are just popping up out of the water everywhere you look. And lots of, a great variety of cetaceans in the Kuril Islands. Uh, Doll's porpoise come and, come and bow ride pretty much every day. Um, orca, we, we inevitably see orca um, on, in the Kuril Islands. Um, sometimes it seems like every day we're seeing orca. It's, it's one, of the best, one of the best places in the world for, for killer whale watching. And the large, uh, the deep trenches between the island, which are very, very deep, um, have sperm whales. And we get the big males coming up here in the summer. Um, I don't have a picture of it, but the Sato's beaked whale, a, a, a newly described species of whale, can be seen in these trenches as well. Um, and then chance for something really, really uh, rare is the North, North Pacific right whale. Um, you'd have to be extremely lucky to see this, but this is, this is the rarest uh, large whale in the world. Um, so, so rare that there isn't really even a, an estimate of their, their population. They're just seen kind of Every, every few years. And um, the, the, this one was one of the most exciting wildlife experiences I've ever had you know, anywhere in the world. We, it, I'll, I'll tell you the story because it's, it, it's kind of an amazing story. It was uh, Robert Dunning and I were standing up on the bridge just, just looking around and he pointed out this whale slapping its, its tail. I said, oh man, that really looks like a right whale's tail. But you know, at, at this time, I don't think there'd been a sighting of a right whale, of, of a Pacific right whale in like years anywhere. So man, that really looks like a right whale. It was lunch, lunchtime was on. Said, man, we have to stop lunch. We stopped lunch. We got everyone out on deck. 
five, the ship went dead in the water. So it's five minutes, nothing, 10 minutes, nothing, 15 minutes. Oh no, it was just this sinking feeling. We've missed this thing. And then it came up like you could stare right down its blowhole. It came up right beside the boat. And I mean, people were, I was so excited. Everyone was just so excited. And um, we got to spend a good amount of time just sort of chilling out with, with the rarest whale in the world with this kind of scenery all around us. So um, that, that's, that's the Curl Islands, pretty special place. Um, so moving right along, next, uh, next area is the Sea of Akot. So that's this, this big sea here bounded by, by Kamchatka and, and the Curl Islands uh, to the east. And um, we do uh, a variety of landings along the coastlines. And here we have the, the taiga forest. So this is the eastern, eastern edge of the taiga forest, which is the, the largest forest in the world. And uh, we just do some, some wilderness landings along the coastlines um, and see you know, very widespread uh, but interesting taiga species like pine grosby, rough-legged hawk, the red fox is very common, ermine. Um, so yeah, all, all sorts of uh, all sorts of interesting things to be seen on our on our landings, um, and then some some of the river mouths have uh, some more localized species like um, large colonies of of Aleutian tern, is uh, is one of the specialties there. Um, but once again, like the Kuril Islands, it's really the islands within the Sea of Okhotsk and their their seabird, and in particular their alcid colonies that are what stand out. Uh, this is at Tulane Island, and these are these are common MERS. There's a research station there, and you can actually get the way they have it set up um, with blinds and stuff. You can actually get pretty much right inside of the colony, and the birds don't don't really know you're you're there. So it's pretty special. Um, ancient merlets breed on most of the most of the islands in the Sea of Okhotsk in in large numbers. Again, we have we have the auklets. This is a, a whiskered auklet again. This was at Ioni Island. So Ioni Island is just this speck in the middle of the Sea of Okhotsk, and um, I think it's the only auklet colony that has all four species of auklets just kind of all nesting side side by side. So that's pretty pretty amazing, um, and it is the best place to see the spectacled guillemot. We see these in in Kamchatka and, and the Kuril Islands as well, um, but this is a very localized uh, Russian breeding species in the Far East. But uh, they do breed in large numbers in the Sea of Okhotsk. And then it's the best place to see the, the long-billed merlet, which we can also see in Kamchatka as well. Um, but th this, is, uh, this is probably one of the hardest alices to see because they have quite a, quite a small range and they seem to be quite rare throughout their range. They're the Asian counterpart to the, to the marbled merlet. And so like that species, they nest in old growth forest. Although I, I think it's still true um, that there've only ever been two nests ever found of these um, long-billed merlets. And we, we see them every trip. We usually see them in Kamchatka as well, but uh, always in small numbers. And um, well, there doesn't seem to be a lot of concern about the status of this species. I, I really wonder about this one because we, we only ever see it in, um, in small numbers anywhere, despite sort of visiting most of its known, known world range. Um, and uh, one of the other islands in the Sea of Akot that I just have to mention is, is Yamsky Island. And, and this is it. And, and I mention it because this, this is another massive seabird colony. And this is the place where this ha has, in the summer breeding season, has more birds than, than anywhere else I've ever been in the world. And, and the, uh, the auklet numbers run into the many millions of auklets. And so it doesn't quite have that drama of Yankicha where you get inside the, the caldera. Um, but the entire sky is just, it's unbelievable um, in, in the late evening. It's it's an order of magnitude higher than the Ankicho, which is just just incredible. Um, and so, for example, least auklet is is the most common one there, but the the Russian biologist estimates six million least auklet breeding on Yankicho. So the the noise and, and the sound in in the evening, it's just uh, again one of the great the great uh, natural history experiences in the world. And all of these islands in the Sea of Okhotsk also have um, very large stellar sea lion haulouts, which uh, love playing around with the boats. And the males get up to 2,500 pounds, so they're enormous, enormous animals. Um, another interesting aspect of the Sea of Okhotsk is that it, it gets pack ice, so um, it's it's a lot colder than than the Pacific Ocean, so up about actually about eight degrees colder than the Pacific Ocean, and so pack ice forms there in the in the winter time, and it persists um, 
persist quite late into the summer. And so we make a point every trip there of, of uh, bumping around in some pack ice. And it's, it's some of the most exciting pack ice on earth, um, to, to be honest. So you can get sites like this, uh, stellar sea eagle sitting with a, a ribbon seal, which is just incredible. Um, so it has four, four species of ice seal um, to be found in the pack ice. Ring seal is, uh, is probably the most common one there. And I think they're really happy here. It's one of the, the only places that you have ring seal and you don't have polar bears. So, so I think they do quite well in the Sea of Akats. Um, but but uh, the, the, the one everyone wants to see is, is a ribbon seal. And uh, this, this is, it's got to be the most spectacularly colored seal in the world, hands down. It's just an in, incredible animal. And uh, I remember the, the, first, the, the first time we went in the Sea of Akats, we'd heard rumors that it, it had ribbon seal but we didn't really know. And within a few minutes of, of getting into the pack ice, we saw one and we were just ecstatic. And I think by the end of the day, we'd seen over a hundred of them. And so the, the years have kind of proven that, that the Sea of Okhotsk in, in the early summer pack ice is, is uh, certainly the best, most reliable place in the world to see this amazing animal. And uh, we paddled, uh, paddled the Zodiac up to this one and uh, it was pretty chilled out with us. It was an amazing moment again. Okay, and moving right along, um, next stop is the Commander Islands. So the Commander Islands, again, they barely show up on the map of this scale, two, two islands right here. So they're the westernmost islands of the Aleutian Island chain. So um, some people are surprised to know that there's more islands in the Aleutians past Attu, and that's Bering and, and Medney Island in the, in the Commanders. So they're treeless islands, um, so some great tundra walking out in the Commanders. This is a grave site of Vitus Bering. So he died here in 1741. This was about 10 years into the second Kamchatka expedition. He died here of scurvy. He was trying to get back to Moscow from a, a brief stop in Alaska. And so he died here. Um, the famous naturalist George Steller sort of picked up the pieces of the expedition and, and got the men back to Kamchatka. Um, and uh, it would have probably been that bay right there below you, which is where we have the only uh, notes um, on on Stellar's sea cow seen in in real life. They they went extinct shortly after, and also the spectacled cormorant, which went extinct shortly after Stellar and Bering were here. Uh, so yeah, great great walks on the tundra. Rock sandpiper breeds in uh, in good numbers in the tundra there. This is uh, Ridgeway's rock ptarmigan, an endemic subspecies of rock ptarmigan to be found in the commanders. Lapland longspur, very familiar bird to, to many of us, is uh, kind of the house sparrow of the, of the Arctic and they're all over the tundra, display fighting and, and singing away. Huge, uh, a chance to visit a huge northern fur seal colony in the northern end of the commander islands. See the little pups there. But, you know, one, once again, uh, the theme continues some of the best experiences to be had in the Commander Islands are the, are the marine ones, uh, the Zodiac cruising, and, and even the ships cruising in this area. Spectacular. So you have your, your uh, bird cliffs, your murres and, and the kittiwakes, which are present on their, on their nests through, through the day. Zodiac cruising around there, pigeon guillemots around during the daytime as well. And uh, we have all, all the auklets are in the Commander Islands as well, not in the numbers of some of those other islands I've been talking about, but um, you do have all four species there as well. This is the, the parakeet auklet. Um, and some of the specialties, red-faced red cormorant, which is, uh, only breeds in a few areas of, of the North Pacific, is particularly common in the Commander Islands. And you see them nesting there, pretty fancy looking cormorant. And red leg kittiwake, which really just breeds on a few isolated islands in the North Pacific, um, is it's a stronghold of the red leg kittiwake. It's actually the only place in Asia where you can see this species. And there's one with a black leg black leg kittiwake. They nest side by side in in these big bird colonies. And with all the seabirds around, uh, the Arctic foxes are happy. And here in the uh, Commander Islands, it's this blue fox, which is a, a darker variant of the Arctic fox. And yeah, another marine mammal uh, stronghold is the Commander Islands. Again, sea otters are, are uh, really common in the Commanders. Harbor seal, a very widespread seal around the Northern Hemisphere is there. 
more stellar sea lions and great whale watching uh, around the commander islands and mo most of this is from the from the big ship uh humpback whale is the most common and sites like this uh, we get pretty regularly where there's just blows all around us as these humpback whales are up here for their for their summer feeding and of course joined by clouds of birds as well lots of uh, killer whales as well in the commander island so these are the the bigs killer whale the uh the marine mammal hunter killer whales of the north pacific and um, we do sometimes see them as well from from the zodiac and a pretty humbling experience when you're sitting in the zodiac and you're looking up at the top of a top of a, a dorsal fin of a of a killer whale and uh, yeah you see those stellar sea lions we're definitely not getting in and out of the water on uh, at this moment fin whales also um often seen around there and even the the huge blue whales which are making a very slow comeback in, in the North Pacific. And uh, we seem to be seeing them with increasingly regularity. It's also, uh, for those interested in beaked whales, it's also a reliable place to see um, Baird's beaked whale, although I don't have a picture of that. And uh, back to the birds, it's also a really good area. Lots of albatross um, come up from, from further south to their, uh, to their feeding areas here in, in the Bering Sea. In the, in the Commander Islands is, is a really great spot for, for these albatross. The Lazan albatross up at the top is the most common. And we usually find one or two black-footed albatross. And I think pretty much every trip now we're seeing um, short-tailed albatross, at least at least one or two. So you're looking for that dark bird with, with the bubblegum pink bill, usually turns up once or twice uh, around the Commander Islands and um, in, in increasing numbers. So. Uh, as many of you will know that this bird was once thought to be extinct, but it uh, isn't in fact extinct and uh, making a, a slow and steady recovery and, and showing up more frequently, both in, in the United States and, and we're seeing the same thing in, uh, in Russia. And uh, the, the adults are very distinctive when, when they come by the boat. Stunning bird. Okay, so that was the Commander Islands, and now we'll start to move further north into this huge region that I've lumped together of, of Kamchatka and Chukotka. They're, they're different, but I didn't really know where to make the break because they kind of merge one into the other. So I've just joined them into one huge region. So this is the Kamchatka Peninsula, and then this whole coast up here. So the Kamchatka Peninsula is forested, and then it starts to kind of give way to, to coastal tundra right about here. And then it's all tundra all the way up the there's on the uh, Koryak coastline and then the Chukotka coastline and, and the Chukotka Peninsula. So an enormous area that we kind of travel along and there's a few islands along the way and then a lot of, uh, of river mouths and bays, estuaries that, that we can explore as we head north along that region. Uh, so the, the scenery in Kamchatka is legendary for uh, its, its snow-capped volcanoes which are sometimes erupting. <laughs> and uh, uh, so pretty, pretty, pretty amazing way to be birding under the shadow of these uh, enormous volcanoes of the Ring of Fire. And then as, as we head further north and yeah, into Koryak and Chukotka areas, uh, you have uh, mountains coming right down to the ocean and, uh, and then a lot of coastal tundra to explore as well. So, incredible remote wilderness hiking experiences. There's no nobody out here. There's nobody out here. You're, you're all alone. Um, and uh, so amazing hiking and archeological sites as well up there. This is uh, Cape Dejna, which is the easternmost point of Asia. And the wildlife to match. So um, stellar sea lion in the Kamchatka Peninsula, stellar sea lion is, is, is the most famous bird. Um, so yeah, we, I mean, we tend to think of stellar sea lion, um, stellar sea eagle as, as sort of a Hokkaido specialty. Most, most birders would go there to see it or, or in the last couple of weeks, maybe to Maine, but, uh, um, really the, the Russian far East is, is the home of the stellar uh, sea eagle. Th this is where they, they nest and breed along these big salmon, salmon rivers. And it's great to spend some time with these incredible birds in their, in their home. So it really needs little little description or introduction. It's uh, certainly one of the most spectacular birds of prey, and they're quite common through um, also in the along the coast of the Sea of Okhotsk, 
and then all through the Kamchatka Peninsula, anywhere there's these big, uh, big salmon rivers. And we usually get some amazing experiences with these. There's usually quite a few of them around. And this one here even landed on the on the light of the ship, which I've only seen that happen once, but uh, very close and personal view of this guy. So that's a stellar sea eagle. Um, but generally, you know, really good tundra sort of birding at, at, as you head north. Passerine diversity is very low, but, but blue throat is one of the most common species. There's a willow ptarmigan. And then th this coastal tundra up through Koryak and, and Chukotka is all, um, all really fun sort of Arctic, Arctic birding. Every pond seems to have a, a pair of long-tailed duck on it. And it has all four species of eider, especially as you head further north into Chukotka. This is a, uh, I guess, a, a post-breeding flock of, of stellar eider here, but enormous numbers of, of eiders along that Chukotka coastline. Uh, Pacific loon are, are quite common as well on the tundra ponds. And then in the right places, um, you can see yellow-billed loon on, on their breeding ground. That's a bit further north in, into Chukotka. And emperor goose, which is uh, only found uh, yeah, along coastal, coastal parts of Chukotka and, and of course Alaska as well, but uh, pretty, pretty exciting to get to spend some time out on the tundra with emperor geese in their, in their breeding grounds. Um, Jeer falcon are actually moderately regular um, sightings as, as, we, as we move north along the coast. This was a nest with four, four white um, babies and uh, this nest actually produced four white babies three years in a row, I think it was. So, so they have a lot of food to eat and, and Jeer falcons do seem to do quite well. Um, there's a few islands along the way and, and steep, uh, steep cliffs as well that have some, some more impressive seabird colonies. Not, not the numbers and diversity of further south, but, but still quite good. And we have puffins uh, throughout the Russian Far East, but I, I find these colonies up here in Kamchatka and, and, and Chukotka uh, are, are some of the more photogenic colonies here. And you can see some of the images we can get on in these colonies. This of course is, is tufted puffin. So there's two species of puffin. Um, the tufted is, is the more, uh, so I guess, distinctive puffin, and then the horn puffin, which looks more like the familiar Atlantic puffin. And they nest side, side by side in, in large colonies, and they're active around the colonies through the day. I mean, more, mornings tend to be best, but they're, they're always around the colonies. And the MERS as well, I mean, about July time, the, the little babies jump off the cliffs before they fledge. So they spend about a week, um, they, they jump into the water from, you know, many dozens of feet high. They, they just kind of glide down on these little wings that can't fly. And then they spend like a week or so uh, swimming in the water before they actually fledge. They just follow their father around out, out to sea. And they've been tracked, you know, swimming hundreds of miles sometimes out at sea. And not in a lot of, in the way of a lot of diversity of, of other um, seabirds in these seas, but basically the entire world population of short shearwater come up here to feed in in the non-breeding season and um, it, the numbers are in in the tens of millions and, and you often see these massive rafts that seem to cover the ocean all around now, of, course, of course many of you will know there's been a, a large die-off here in the last few years so um, I'm, I'm not sure if the numbers are still going to be quite as spectacular but but this was a frequent sighting up in the in the Bering and Chukchi seas in, in the summertime these enormous rafts of short-tailed shearwaters um, but yeah, in terms of this region uh, and the birding, the, I guess the most, um, most well-known aspect of it is the shorebirds. So, so many of us are used to seeing shorebirds in, in winter and, and on passage where, where they're a lot of fun to, to sort them out. But getting to see these shorebirds up, up in their breeding habitats is, it's a totally different game. They just turn into different animals up there with, with um, their bright colors, amazing displays, crazy vocalizations. And I, I really love spending time on the tundra with breeding shorebirds. And so the Chukotka Peninsula ha, is the most diverse area for breeding shorebirds of, of anywhere in the Arctic uh, in terms of species. So the redneck phalarope, a really familiar one on, on the tundra ponds. Uh, this is a Pacific golden plover. So they favor the, the dry tundra areas. 
Dunlin favor the, the boggy areas. Redneck Stint, which is an East Asian specialty. They're maybe the most common of all the, all the shorebirds up there. Even North American species like Western Sandpiper um, breed in, in good numbers there in, in Chukotka. We don't really think of that as an Asian bird very often, but they do breed in good numbers there. Um, but of course, uh, the most famous one, one that everyone wants to see when they're heading up to this area is the notorious Spoonbilled Sandpiper, an amazing looking bird. Um, but, you know, endemic, endemic as a breeder to Northern Kamchatka and, and Chukotka, but, uh, you know, tra tragically becoming very, very rare. Their, um, their numbers were, were plummeting for, for, for several decades there. And then around, I guess, around the year, around 2000 to 2010, somewhere in there, folks started to realize, well, there's, there's actually only, there's actually only a few hundred of these left at, at best. And, and these birds are in serious danger of extinction. And um, so there's been a lot of work, some of which we've been involved in over the years um, with heritage expeditions, um, with, with the recovery of, of this species. Uh, been a lot of work going on um, to, to try and stem the tide, but uh, I, I, I hate to say it, but it's, it's, it's not looking great at the moment. The last winter count was uh, was only 137 birds, which was about a, a third of what was kind of hoped to to be seen on the on their wintering grounds. Um, so they continue to drop, um, but you know there there is still hope. But but the species is really tragically low in population, and um, but uh, you know at, at present we we do still get to get to see these birds when we go up there. Um, and this is typically how we see them. This is at Mina Pilgano, um, which which we do visit, and and it's kind of where the place where the spoonbill sandpiper is making its its last stand. There's there's about twenty breeding pairs in that area, and um, it, I think it's with with all the research that's gone on, I think it's becoming pretty clear that this is this is the last sort of sizable breeding area uh, of spoonbill sandpipers left. Um, so they're a real habitat specialist. They, they tend to only breed on this crowberry tundra. And yeah, I mean, you, you can certainly go and see them. It's easier to get to, uh, to their wintering areas in Thailand and see them down there. But to see, uh, to see a, a richly colored spoonbilled sandpiper calling out on, on the crowberry tundra at Mina Pilgano, that's, that's going to be a highlight of, of any birder's life um, for sure. And so, yeah, th this is how we typically see them, th these kind of views. Um, Chris Collins took this picture in 2011. This this was a, an exceptional encounter, and this this actually happened to be at, at a, a new breeding site we discovered. So we managed to find two new breeding sites for for spoonbill sandpipers over the course of our uh, over the course of our trips there along the Russian Far East coastline. Okay, so uh, that's the spoonbill sandpiper. Um, Moving on, just a quick look at the, some of the mammals of this region. So you're in prime bear country up here. And um, I think it's fair to say we, we do see brown bears almost every day um, when we're in, in Kamchatka and Chukotka. There's an incredible population density of brown bears and they're, they're massive bears. The Kamchatka brown bear is um, the second largest subspecies of brown bear, only the Kodiak bear is larger. And th this was a particularly huge bear. This one was actually at Mina Pilgano as well. Where the spoonbill sandpiper is, and they're up uh, they're up in this area feeding on the on the salmon runs at this time of the year. Some amazing salmon runs along these big big rivers. Um, lots of other mammals to to see during our explorations here. Arctic ground squirrel is ubiquitous. This is a northern pika. They love the rock piles. This is a rarely seen Kamchatka marmot. Uh, which allegedly hibernates 11 months out of the year, it's supposed to be the, the longest any animal hibernates. And we do even see wolverine, you know, very rarely, you would never expect to see a, a wolverine on one of these trips, but we have actually seen them uh, a few times over the years. And th this was my most memorable wolverine sighting. Uh, Aaron and I were out scouting uh, scouting a landing site in, in northern Chukotka and we came across this wolverine and we, we eventually worked out that it had a bearded seal that it was it was feeding on and uh, it wasn't going to leave the area so it, it was just me and him in the boat but so we went back to the ship we loaded up 50 people into five zodiacs and we just sat offshore watching this wolverine for like half an hour going about its life 
in, in the Chicoca tundra. Pretty amazing. Um, yeah, so this, this coastline doesn't maybe have the, the diversity of marine mammals, but it's got large, large numbers. Um, largest seal is, is the most common of the seals. Beluga whales uh, feed, I think they're feeding on salmon. They're, you see them in, in a lot of these uh, estuaries and, and river mouths where the salmon are running. Um, and they're, they're, they are quite common um, as you go further north. And then gray whales, so most of the world population of gray whales ends up in, in this coastline feeding through, through the summer. And we usually get some pretty, pretty special experiences with the gray whales. So these are the same, uh, these are the same gray whales that, that calve in, in Baja. So they're used to boats and, and they're usually quite inquisitive around boats. And um, just like in Baja, they sometimes like to come and come and rub the boats, which is always a pretty exciting experience. You can't actually see the whale in that picture, but it, it gave the boat a little nudge and a exciting moment for those in the boat. That's my wife there in the, in the purple, Megan, um, having a look. And uh, a shout out to Megan, a lot of the pictures in this talk are, are hers and she spent a lot of time in the Russian Far East uh, as well. Okay, so coming to our last region of the talk, it's Wrangell Island in, in the, far, the far north. So now we're getting up into the high order. So Wrangell Island is way up here, this, this island up here. And so trips there usually visit the, the north coast of Chukotka and then, and then Wrangell and Harold Island, which are up at uh, 71 degrees north. So way above the Arctic Circle. And now, now we're getting into real high Arctic. Um, so the, the island is surrounded by uh, pack ice for almost all the year. It actually, until fairly recently, it used to be always surrounded by pack ice to the point where it was pretty hard to get an expedition vessel in now, but uh, in there. But now, now there's uh, definitely a, a summer window when you can reliably get expedition vessels in there because the ice, is, ice isn't there anymore. Um, so yeah, apart from the pack ice, uh, we do lots of long walks out, out on the tundra and um, Wrangell Island wasn't glaciated in the last ice age, so it's, it's said to have the most diverse Arctic flora of, uh, of any, any Arctic tundra site in the world. So some, some wonderful walks out on the tundra and lots of, lots of the high Arctic wildlife to look at up there. Arctic fox are quite common on Wrangell and often very inquisitive. And muskox, herds of muskox dotted around on the tundra. Um, so Wrangell was actually the last place that uh, woolly mammoths probably persisted on Earth. And um, the thinking is that there were woolly mammoths on Wrangell Island at least uh, three three thousand years ago, and maybe even more more recently. But of course, no more. Um, we do see their tusks occasionally, but uh, now the biggest land mammal there is the muskox. Um, the birding, you know, once you get this far north, the diversity starts to tail off, but it's, uh, it's all these classic uh, high Arctic species are up on Wrangell, um, particularly the earlier trips, um, the earlier trips that we run up there, if you can get up there in, in, in July, especially July into early August, um, before some of the birds start hitting out is, is the best time for the birding up there. So king, king eider are... Uh, are pretty classic species up there. Snow geese, it's one of the only spots in Asia where snow geese breed and, and they're in, in large numbers out on the tundra. The high Arctic shorebirds um, are, you know, they always seem to be a bit hit and miss the shorebirds up there, but um, some years there's quite a few shorebirds breeding. This is black-bellied plover, red knot, decli another declining uh, shorebird species. And uh, Wrangell, it, well, Wrangell has two species of lemming, but it actually has an, its own endemic lemming. The, this is the Wrangell Island lemming. And there always seem to be um, quite a few lemmings around. Some, some years, incredible numbers, but there always seem to be quite a few lemmings around. And um, it does seem to sustain um, all three species of Jaeger, which, which breed out there. And this is the, the long-tailed Jaeger. And of course, snowy owl. So. Um, there's, there always seem to be snowy owl and wrangle. It's the only, it's the only place in the Arctic that I go that, that there just always seem to be snowy owl. Most, most places they're kind of eruptive and presumably following the, the lemming boom, booms and busts, but Wrangell Island always seems to have at least a few snowy owls around and, and sometimes a lot of snowy owls. Ivory gull, ivory gull is very, very rare on Wrangell Island. Um, 
but but we have seen it. But it, don't don't expect to see an ivory gull there. You'd be very lucky. Um, but say, Sabine's gull are more common. Um, they breed there and and they forage in the Chukchi Sea in in large numbers. Um, a few alcids that you know the puffins are there. Black guillemot. Uh, this far north you start to get black guillemot and the uh, kitlets is merlet actually. We see them pretty regularly around Wrangell Island. And uh, once again, you know, like everywhere else in the Far East, a really rich marine, marine mammal fauna as well. Um, several of the high Arctic seals are up there. Beard, bearded seal is one of the most common. Um, the gray whales, just like in Chukotka, are feeding up there. And uh, it is a place where you have a, a pretty good chance to see bowhead whale. Um, so not, not Wrangell Island itself, but in, in the Chukchi Sea on the way up to Wrangell Island. It's, um, you know, th this is a, a, a massive Arctic whale that every traveler to the Arctic kind of dreams of seeing bowhead whale, but yeah, there aren't a lot of accessible sites to actually, to actually get to them. And this is one, one of them um, on the way up to Wrangell Island in, in the Chukchi Sea, a big black whale with a white jaw. Um, walrus are really common, you know, both in northern Chukotka and, uh, and Wrangell itself. Um, the largest, it's the largest haul-ups of walrus in, in the world. Um, some, we, we do sometimes, they're unpredictable, but we do sometimes see haul-ups in, in the tens of thousands of walrus, and they're very inquisitive around the boats. So you get some amazing, amazing experiences with walrus. Both. So er, earlier in the season, they'll be on the ice flows, and then as the ice disappears, and they start to haul up on the on the beaches. And uh, of course, polar bear. So so Wrangell Island is is the polar bear central of the world. Really, about a, a third of the world's polar bears are said to be born on Wrangell Island, and, and we certainly the the bears den in in the in the winter, but we certainly see a lot of polar bears up there in the summer. So the earlier season trips, um, they're out on the pack ice around the island, and uh, and so yeah, we we try and get some really nice encounters of of bears on the ice. As the uh, as the season progresses and, and the ice drifts away, um, they all start to move on on land, and um, I, I I think it's fair to say that late, later in the season we we often see you know over a hundred polar bears uh, on a, on a single trip, so you know where most trips to the Arctic you're kind of hoping to see one polar bear in in Wrangell Island you're you're going to see large numbers of polar bear you, you will see large numbers of polar bear uh, of course. Uh, a number of them are going to be far away, but there's there's so many bears up there that we we really strive to get some some top notch bear encounters. And just because there's so many bears there, Wrangell pretty much uh, pretty much always delivers. And um, yeah, this this was the last slide of the uh, of the presentation. So uh, it was a huge area to cover. I've I've just kind of gone over some of the highlights, um, but I, I hope I give you a, a good appreciate a good appreciation. Of, of the area and some of the reasons why why I find it so so exciting and so yeah thanks to everyone for listening and again thanks to Megan uh, Megan Kelly my wife a lot of these pictures were hers thank you ah oh, fantastic Adam wow what a what a way to kick off 2022 that was uh, that was very very special indeed and I mentioned to you before the uh, before the webinar that it wasn't a part of the world that I really you know knew in depth or or a huge amount about and. Um, I mean that overview has just widened, you know, my uh, my my breadth and 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 my interest really in in the area. It's a fascinating part of the world. I've, I've never been up into the Arctic zone, so it's uh, yeah. Just just sorry to cut you off, Keith, but I mean, yeah. in my experience, you know, those of us who work there and those those of us who travel there, I mean, everyone who goes there is blown away by the Russian Far East. It's, it's just, it's not on a lot of people's radar, but those who've gone there just get blown away by it. There's something very special about that region. Yeah, yeah, it certainly, it certainly feels that way. Um, and I think we can all pick up on, on your passion for the area as well. Um, you know, it sort of comes through in the, in the amazing, amazing pictures. Um, and I mean, yeah, there's the amazing pictures and the amazing stories. And uh, yeah, everything that you've just shared with us today, it's uh, absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Adam. I know there's, uh, there's a few questions around as well, um, which Nikki will get to, to shortly. Um, and yeah, a lot, of, a lot of very positive comments coming through as well. People just saying, brilliant presentation. Thanks so much, says Anne. Um, yeah, great webinar, awesome photos, says Suzette. 
Um, so yeah, uh, many thanks. Adam mouthwatering animals says cats here as well. So I mean, there's just um, people really enjoying it. And yeah, thank you for kicking off our, our 2022 set of webinars in, in such fine fashion. Um, just as well, folks, uh, you will have seen a, a couple of notes going up there in the, in the chat as well. Um, we do have a few um, uh, pretty hot specials um, with regards to these to, to some of these uh, Russian cruisers um, that are going on this year. So do check those out. Uh, if you want more information, please to get hold of us at info at rockjumper.com. Um, you can obviously also check out on the website. We've got all the itineraries up there. You can see exactly the way it's all it all works and all gets put together. And um, yeah, just uh, just as well, uh, we usually introduce the next webinar now going forward, uh, which you, which most of you who are regular viewers will will know. Um, what we're doing this year is we're getting back into travel a whole lot more, um, and our tour leaders don't quite have the the time to uh, to spend putting together. Uh, hundreds of hundreds of slides and uh, these things do take time to put together so what we're going to do is have a webinar once a month going forward so there'll be something very special uh, once a month we'll announce it you'll get the emails uh, you can also go onto rock jumpers website as well and go to the webinar page itself uh, and you'll see the schedule of the next webinars that we've got lined up as well so um, you'll see sort of our next three that are going to be coming ahead uh, the next day to die rise is the 16th of february but you will be uh, well informed um, of exactly what the topic will be beforehand as per usual and I do think that I've said enough there's so many more great comments coming through yeah thank you everyone and yeah over to you Nikki oh thank you Keith uh, I agree what a spectacular part of the world and I really could see um, my non-birding family members enjoying Absolutely. it with me um, so it's like a win-win uh, I really can't wait to to travel there myself so yeah, let's get to Q&A. Um, first question is life jackets. Um, uh, you know, life jackets, temperature and walking conditions. Uh, wh what could we expect when we're on a trip like this? Oh yeah, this is such a huge area. It's hard to give generalizations. So life, life jackets, you'll, um, you, I'm not quite sure what the question is, but you'll need to wear life jackets in the Zodiac. And then yeah. you know, on, on the main ship, there's, emergency life jackets like on any boat if, if the ship's going to go down or something but you, you never you never wear those but yeah you, you wear these small um, automatic life jackets um, just just in the zodiacs and then you take them off for your walks I mean yeah, yeah te temperatures generally speaking cool um, you know in the it's a huge region I, I I can't give generalization but you know five somewhere between five to 15 degrees most days. Um, so cool, but not cold, not cold, certainly not, not uh, cold. Um, and yeah, I mean, walking. Um, so I, I didn't talk much about the walking. It's, it's, it's quite a, quite a special part. And I didn't mention it, but quite a special part of the Russian Far East is that you had a fair amount of freedom there compared to most places that, um, that expedition vessels go. So there, there's a saying in Russia, nothing is permitted, but anything is possible. So you have to, you have to jump through a lot of hoops to, to get there. And that's, you know, that's the, the ship organizers have, have to jump through those hoops. Um, but when, once you're there, you have a lot of freedom um, yeah. to, to, to explore. It's like, oh, this bay looks nice. Why don't we go there and have, have a walk around? Um, but, you know, typically um, we'll, we'll split up into groups. There's usually several guides. Because most of this is in bear country, we usually do um, guided walks, certainly on Wrangell Island, uh, very, very closely guided walks. Um, but having said that, we'll, we'll split up and um, we'll, you know, some people can stay on the beach if they don't want to walk anywhere. And, and there may be an option for, uh, for a 10 mile walk. <laughs> so it's everything, whatever you want, really, there's usually options for it. Oh, that's great. And access to Zodiacs, uh, quite easy. They can hop onto a Zodiac at any time, go looking at things or... Oh, yeah. No, access to Zodiac. No, it, it doesn't quite work, work like that um, because, you know, there, there, are, there are only so many guides on the boat. So, so the activities are a bit more structured than that. Um, there's only so many guides and so many Zodiacs. Um, so typically we, we all go out uh, as a big group on, on a landing together. So, um, so, so either, um, 
either we'll sort of ferry everyone to shore and then you can come back to the boat as you want from your landing. And then in Zodiac cruises, we'll kind of, we'll, we'll kind of load all the Zodiacs together. So you don't get like private, private Zodiac cruises on demand or something like that. Uh, oh, is it right. really going to happen on these trips? It's kind of group, group activities um, ba based around what we think are the best, best experiences for the group, best landings and best um, wildlife cruise opportunities, stuff like that. Absolutely. And um, where does the tour start if, if you're coming from the U.S.? Yeah, so um, as I sort of alluded to, let me see if I can find this slide again. Just So there's a bunch of different itineraries here, but if, if we, I'll, I'll go through the three, the three that we have the uh, specials on right now. So the Ring of Fire starts here in, oh, sorry, let me get my... Yeah, there's my pointer. So the Ring of Fire starts here in, in Hokkaido, Otaru. So you'd have to fly to Hokkaido. And then it ends in Petropavlovsk, Kamchatsky. Um, so you, you'll be flying home from Kamchatka. The Siberia's Forgotten Coast starts in, um, in, in Kamchatka. It's basically combines with that trip, so you could do them both. And then ends in Nome, Alaska. So if you did those two trips, for example, you could start in Japan and end in Nome. And then the um, Chukotka. Chukotka Wrangell Island trip um, starts and ends in Nome. So that would be, for an American, that would actually be the, the easiest one to, to, uh, to do. You just fly up to Nome, Alaska, and then you get on and off the boat there. Oh, great. Uh, what are the visa requirements for uh, USA citizens? Yeah, you, uh, so you, you have to get a, a tourist visa to, to, go to, to, to go to Russia, and um, you do that through the Russian embassy. You, uh, typically, you'll mail, you'll mail in your passport, and, uh, yeah. and they'll return. You can, you can just do it direct with the embassy, or most, most people do use these uh, visa agencies. Um, and Adam, will you be guiding any of these cruises? Uh, yes, I guide, I guide some, some trips for... Uh, 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 in, in the Russian Far East, I, I haven't done any. Well, I haven't done any for a couple of years. They have been they have been running these trips. Um, uh, even even this past past summer, they they ran a, a full uh, a full season. Um, yeah, I, pro I probably won't be doing any any this summer. But uh, I'm look, looking at, at being on some. I, I I yeah, I don't I don't know for sure. But I, I will be on some of these trips. I just can't tell you exactly which ones. And um. Uh, you, know, the, you know, looking at the three different trips that we're offering this year, um, uh, if you were to choose one and only had time for one, which would you select? Yeah, um, that's that's what everyone wants to know because the trips, the trips are so different and they're all kind of equally good. So me personally, I would do this. My favorite trip, to be honest, is this Forgotten Coast, this Kamchatka to Chukotka trip, where you get out and explore these, you know, remote remote tundra areas, and you know, a, a lot of some of these areas. This is why we've found new spoonbilled sandpiper colonies here because no ornithologist, no bird watcher had ever been to these places ever. So I mean, that's that's pretty pretty exciting um, to just go to a, a tundra site. That could have all these amazing birds and know that you know, you, know, you have no idea what you might find out there. Um, so that that is that is my favorite. These trips are all about two weeks long. Um, so yeah, but that's kind of the I guess I'd say that's kind of the focus of that trip is getting up to these remote remote or tundra areas. The uh, Ring of Fire trip is really about these acid colonies if, and marine mammals. But if, if you if if you'd really like to see one of those amazing awkward colonies, that would be the highlight there. And then the northern the northern trip um, is you know up to Wrangell Island early season when when the birds are still breeding. The polar bears are going to be out on the ice. Um, so the, those are the walrus are going to be out on the ice. So that's that's kind of yeah. Which oh. which one do you prioritize? Yeah, I know. It's hard to choose. Um, I saw a couple of questions asking about um, a Ross Gull, Ross's Gull. Do we see that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ross's Gull will be a no, unfortunately. Um, they they breed further. They breed further to the uh, west here. They breed in, in the big river deltas along the North Siberian coast. Um, so they come through the region in um, 
it's October, the same, the same time when the, uh, when they show up off Barrow, Alaska, those same flocks um, come, come through the north coast of Russia. And then they do winter. They winter in the pack ice here in the, in the Chukchi Sea. Um, but uh, you won't, unless you got a vagrant or something, you won't see a Roscoe on, the, on these trips. Oh, great. I've, I've got a question here. How many passengers on, on the ship that will be used? Uh, yeah, so the, the Heritage Adventure, which these trips are going to be run on, is going to be 150. 150. Oh, great. And Tristan is asking, what is the sea conditions like uh, during those tours? Are they rough waters to be expected? Yeah, very good question. Um, generally, some of there are some of the calmer seas that, that we run expedition trips on. Um, you know, the Bering Sea is famous for its big waves, the world's deadliest catch and all that stuff, but that's, that's in the fall winter time. Um, gen generally, um, generally fairly sheltered uh, waters, you know, there's always, there's always going to be a, a chance of a storm coming through. Um, but generally speaking, some of the more sheltered waters uh, to run an expedition cruise in. And, and, and Suzette is saying uh, outerwear and equipment, um, is it provided or do you provide a list of what needs, uh, what is needed to stay warm? Yeah, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure for these specific trips, uh, what would be, there would definitely be a list provided and usually uh, at least rubber boots, um, but there would be a detailed, a detailed packing list and, you know, the, it's cool but not cold, but it, the important thing on these trips is to stay dry. So a, a really good outer, outer jacket and outer pants that keep you dry and, and really solid uh, boots for walking around in the squishy tundra and all that are, are, are the most important things. And then the layers to keep warm. But there will be a detailed packing list. Uh, absolutely. And, and uh, why we didn't see the um, life jackets is they're actually underneath the jackets that everyone is wearing. So some of the pictures look like uh, folks weren't wearing life jackets, but it was just... Underneath. Oh, I think if any picture in a Zodiac, the people would be wearing life jackets. They're, you might yeah. not recognize them. As, I'll, I'll just... I'll, here, here's a picture. So those red things, those red things are the life jackets. Yeah. So they're, they're, they, when they hit salt water, there's a canister in them that, that inflates them. And so they're, they're very lightweight. They're, you can move your arms freely around. They're very easy to, to move around. And, and then, but they do, I mean, I, I promise you they work. As soon as they hit the water, they, they're like. Um, oh, Polly, Polly says, um, she's so sorry that she's late. And Polly, don't worry, we are recording this webinar and we will email it out uh, to everyone. Uh, as well as putting it up onto our media tab on our website. But Polly's just asking, um, uh, it might have been already covered, but is there chances of the Arctic loon or data? Yeah, the, the Arctic loon is, is, is quite common, um, uh, sort of uh, in, in the more south, southerly half. Um, so like uh, through, through uh, Coral Islands and then Kamchatka, we usually see quite a lot of Arctic loons up to about Chukotka. And then in Chukotka, they get replaced by the, the Pacific loon just in the very northern part there. But yeah, I, I didn't have a picture one, didn't mention it, but, but we usually see the Arctic or black-throated loon um, in the more southerly trips. Um, and we should have clarified this earlier, but um, when you said the temperature is 5 to 15, did you mean yeah. Celsius or Fahrenheit? Yeah. So Celsius, so what, like four, uh, 40, to, 40 to 55 or something like that Fahrenheit. I'm not good on conversions. I think it's Celsius, but it, yeah, 40 to 55. So cool, but not, not cold. Oh, great. I think that's all the questions. I'm um, having a look. We've gone through oh, one last one uh, that's come through. If anyone wants to send any more questions, please do send. But the one that I've got here is how about internet and communication while um, on board? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm not 100% sure what it, what it would be. Ge generally, there is uh, at least a basic email. There would be at least a basic email service. And there's always a satellite phone on this, this, uh, on these boats. And you know, in, increasingly, you're able to to have sort of almost full internet range. When you start to get um, above the Arctic Circle, though, um, often often there just is no internet coverage available with sort of any system. 
Um, so the very high Arctic trips might be a bit sketchier for that, but generally speaking, you'll, you'll at least be able to get a, a short email any any time. Oh, fantastic. And that concludes the end of our, our um, webinar. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you, Keith. I really appreciate your time. Uh, some beautiful photos, great place to go. I can't wait to travel there soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone from Rock Thank Jumper. You. Enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers. Bye. Everyone, bye bye.